Hey class, this week we are going to cover chapter six, which gives you a bit of a broad overview of groups and organization. Now, as with almost all of my lectures, a good place to start is with some clear definitions. So we're gonna start with a definition of a group. And a group is any collection of at least two people who interact with some frequency and who share a sense of identity that is aligned with the group. So for example, over there on the right, the top picture, a sports team is a pretty quintessential um, example of a group. There's more than two people. They practice daily, maybe five times a week at least. So they interact with some frequency. And of course, they share a sense of identity because they're on the same team. But every gathering is not necessarily a group. So we'll look at two examples here. So one example is the aggregate, otherwise known as the crowd. And this is when people exist in the same place at the same time but they don't necessarily interact with each other or share any sense of identity. So for example, that middle picture, people just standing in line at Starbucks or standing in line to go on a roller coaster at Six Flags, that would be an example of an aggregate or a crowd, but not a group because um, though there are more than two people, they don't necessarily interact with frequency and they don't necessarily share a sense of identity other than they both like coffee or they both like uh, roller coasters. So a second example is the category and a category um, consists of people who share similar characteristics but they're not tied to one another in any way. So for example millennials or baby boomers describes a category of people who were born um, for millennials between 1980 and 2000 or baby boomers, um, people who were born right after the World War II. Um, but just because people are born in the same decade or same generation doesn't necessarily mean that they interact with frequency, that they all know each other, um, and they don't necessarily share a sense of identity. So groups like political parties, they play an important role in society and groups play a significant role in how we understand and define ourselves, um, the people that we interact with and share a sense of identity with also help to kind of frame our understanding of current events and things that are going on in the world. So as enduring social units, they help foster shared value systems. Now, back in late 1800s and early 1900s, the sociologist Charles Cooley um, came up with a division of groups into two broad categories. So the first category are primary groups, and these are generally smaller in number. They are made up of individuals who engage in face-to-face -face contact, over long-term emotional relationships. And Cooley said that primary groups serve an expressive function, meaning that they serve emotional needs. So these are the types of groups um, who know you the best. Um, these are the types of people and groups who when you need life advice or need to share something that you're going through, um, these are the people who you go to, to kind of share those emotional um, needs with each other. And Cooley described primary groups as, quote, the nursery of human nature, as these groups help us to shape our personalities and our sense of self. So for example, our family members, our best friends, our significant others. And if you think back to chapter five um, and think about those social group agents of of socialization that we went over, the family and the peer groups. 
um, that same kind of category can be applied to the primary groups. So his next broad category are secondary groups, and these are larger and more impersonal. They're more focused on accomplishing tasks within a certain time limit. And there's not very much social intimacy going on here. And because of that, Cooley said that secondary groups serve an instrumental function. So instrumental function meaning that they're primarily focused on completing goals and tasks. They're not, um, they're not primarily focused on serving the emotional needs of the group members but just getting things done together in a timely way. So for example, um, the classroom is a secondary group. It's a larger, more impersonal um, group. We're focused on learning material, so that's the task. And within a time limit, we have um, you know, our course schedule, try to stay to the schedule so that you all can learn everything in a timely manner. And by the end of the semester, um, hopefully you earn an A and that's the goal. Um, but again, like with a classroom, there's not that much social intimacy. Um, you don't show up to class every week because everyone in the class and your teacher are your best friends. You show up because you are working toward um, excelling in your academic work, you show up to class because you want to get an A, you show up to class because you want to um, graduate from high school or college. So there's more of an instrumental function um, to the classroom than just purely emotional. And some other examples of secondary groups would be the workplace, um, trade unions, and political parties. Now we're going to go over in-groups and out-groups. So this kind of us versus them mentality. So one of the ways that groups can be powerful is through inclusion and exclusion. So the in-group is defined as the group that a person feels that he or she belongs to. And the out-group is the group that somebody feels they don't belong to. And we see examples of in-groups and out-groups um, all over the place in our society. I think uh, one very easy one to point out would be between like Republicans and Democrats in our political um, system. Or think about sports teams and the rivalries and um, or different trade unions who might be um, have opposing interests or different fraternities or sororities on a campus. Um, to the people that belong to those sports teams or unions or fraternities or political parties, they see others in the same group, um, at, that's their in-group. Those are the people that they feel they belong with, they have common interests and common goals. And the out-group is a group that they don't belong to. Now, this concept of in-groups and out-groups it performs a critical role in socialization. The groups that we're part of certainly um, help to mold us and socialize us, but also when we define ourselves as not part of another specific group, it also helps to kind of clearly delineate our identity over time, what we like and what we don't like, and who we feel at home with and who we don't. Um, so in-groups and out-groups, they're not all bad. They play a critical role in um, building our identities as social beings. But in-groups and out-groups can also, of course, bring along a lot of negative effects um, if things go a little too far and um, kind of out-groups become defined as others or not like us or inferior. So in groups and out groups, it can lead to judging others negatively based on ethnicity, sexuality, age, occupation. For example, white supremacist movements um, and the bullying of gay and lesbian students in schools, 
um, kind of takes that in-group, out-group um, function to, to a quite negative um, conclusion. So next, we are going to delve a little bit into reference groups. And a reference group is a group of people that people compare themselves to. So it's a standard of measurement for people to aspire to. Peer groups are the most common reference groups. Most people pay attention to what people with whom they interact on a regular basis are wearing, what hobbies they enjoy, what music they listen to. Um, of course, media, advertisers, and business, they've also kind of curated a, a digital world of reference groups in which um, today's younger adults and teens are constantly tuned in. And we'll talk about a documentary on the next slide, which um, goes into depth on that subject. So most people have more than one reference group. And these reference groups can sometimes um, have competing messages with each other. So for example, a girl in middle school might look as her classmates as one reference group, but then her parents and her grandparents would be another. And her neighbors, maybe her childhood best friend down the road um, is yet another. Her friends at church or a sports team would be another reference group. Siblings and cousins, your favorite celebrities on TV. So these are all different reference groups and depending how strongly we feel inclined to any one of them, um, the messages conveyed by that one group might outweigh all the other ones. Now on this slide, there's a um, link to watch a video a documentary um, produced by PBS called Generation Like. And this film is interested in um, kids that are spending more and more time in these digital spaces. And the film claims that they don't completely understand what's going on in those digital spaces. Um, so in particular, they're talking about like social media. And the main question of this film is what are companies doing to kids through technology and how can we make ourselves more aware? Um, the film analyzes the competition over likes between kids on social media and how kids are in a way being socialized to judge their own identity based on how many likes they get and especially in comparison with their other reference groups or friends or family members and compare um, how many likes they get compared to the people they know. So when we quote unquote like things on social media, it in a way becomes part of our identity that we broadcast to the world. And um, this film says, for kids today, you are what you like. So this film, it looks into kind of this careful construction that we all kind of put into our online identities. And it looks particularly at um, YouTube influencers. In particular, this um, video looks at and interviews Tyler Oakley and kind of how he became an influencer and also looks at how once kind of these influencers gain a certain number of followers, companies and businesses will start working with them to advertise their products. Um, so a lot of more like product placement and corporate sponsorship, you'll um, notice are part of um, a lot of these YouTube channels that uh, have a lot of followers. So the conclusion of the video is that teens are no longer just marketed to as they were in the 80s and the 90s, but teens become part of the marketing strategy themselves. Teens are advertising to each other. Um, so in this way, the consumer also becomes the marketer. And um, 
the broad general conclusion is that almost every moment of our lives now is a branding opportunity. Now, a lot of groups, of course, um, have leaders. And so we're gonna talk about leadership functions and different leadership styles on this slide. So there's two primary leadership functions and the function of a leader basically means the goal or the focus of the leader. So what they invest their time um, doing. So first, an instrumental leader is one who's more goal and oriented and focused on accomplishing set tasks. And an example of an instrumental leader would be an army general or a CEO of a company. And on the other hand, we have expressive leaders. And these kind of leaders promote emotional strength and health. Um, they ensure that people feel supported, so they kind of provide that emotional um, need for people and their followers. So, for example, a lot of social or religious leaders fall under this um, line. Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi are both um, good examples of expressive leaders. Now, there are three different types of leadership styles. There's democratic, laissez-faire, and authoritarian. So democratic, you should be familiar with. Um, a democratic leadership style, um, the leader will encourage group participation in decision-making. When you take votes and have a meeting where they hear everyone's perspective and try to come up with some sort of consensus or common ground. Then um, on the other hand, you have authoritarian leadership styles. And authoritarian leaders, they're not really interested in building consensus or hearing everyone's um, opinions on how to do things or accomplish tasks. An authoritarian leader is going to issue orders they will assign tasks to specific people, and there'll be a very strong focus on meeting goals within a certain timeline. So it's very, very hierarchical, very top down. And then in the middle, we have laissez-faire. And this is a hands-off leadership style. If you remember back in high school or college, studying economics and laissez-faire economics, um, basically, laissez-faire economics means that the state does not interfere in the market. And so if we take that to apply it to leadership styles, a laissez-faire leader is going to be very hands-off. They're going to allow the members of the group to kind of manage themselves, make their own decisions, and maybe will only step in um, every once in a while just to give some general advice how to do things better um, in the future. So these are your two main leadership functions, the instrumental and the expressive, and then the three main leadership styles, democratic, authoritarian, and laissez-faire. So on the next couple slides, we're going to think about groups and conformity and peer pressure. So what is conformity? It's the extent to which an individual will comply with the group norms or expectations. So back in 1950s, sociologist Solomon Ash was very interested in peer pressure and conformity. And so he studied conformity within small groups and conducted experiments to analyze the social pressure to conform. So in 1951, he performed the ASH experiment, as it's known now. And what he did was he had eight people sit at a table. Only one of those people was the subject of the experiment, which meant that the other seven people knew what was happening. They were part of the experiment. 
So only one person is really being tested here. So he showed the eight people a card with a vertical line on it and then showed them a card with three vertical lines of different lengths. And if you see the um, little graphic to the bottom left of this slide, you will see a little illustration of what I'm talking about. So he asked all of the eight people to identify which line on the second card was the same length as the one on the first to so the reference line. That um, line that's labeled X on the graphic. And then he asked them to compare it to the um, lines A, B, and C and say which one was the same length as X. Now remember only one person is actually being studied here. The other seven people are going to say what Ash has instructed them to say. So seven of the people at the table would purposely respond with the wrong answer. So they might say the line C is the same length as X, even though that's obviously um, much longer than X. And the experiment was to measure whether social pressure would affect the single subject to see whether or not he or she would go against their own better judgment and agree with the rest of the group even though they clearly had the wrong answer. And in many instances, the subject of the experiment would go against their own judgment and select the wrong answer in order to agree with the rest of the group. Now, on this slide is a video with some footage from the ASH experiment. Hope y'all will take the time to watch it. It's not too long. And it just has some um, footage of the experiment and shows some different variations that Ash kind of threw in there to um, assess how strong peer pressure is under different situations as well. Now, another sociologist, Amatai Etzioni, was writing in the 1990s and he was mostly interested in formal organizations and modern organizations. So he defined formal organizations as large and impersonal secondary groups and he claimed that all formal organizations are or will become a bureaucracy. Now what's a bureaucracy? We'll talk more about that on the next uh, several slides after this one. So Etzioni claimed that formal organizations fall into three broad categories. Number one, normative or voluntary organizations. These are organizations that are based on shared interests. So you join a soccer club or a book club or the Audubon Society um, because you love birds and um, so you, this is a voluntary organization. No one's forcing you to do it. You're joining it because you want to meet other people who have similar interests to you. So the second formal organization is a coercive organization. And these are ones where the group membership is based on coercion or forceful persuasion to join. So a cult or a prison or a rehab center would be examples of more coercive organizations. And then number three, the utilitarian organization. And these are ones that are joined because of the need for a specific material reward. <coughs> so you don't join um, these because of shared interests, for instance, you share them because you want to kind of reap a specific reward or benefit from being a part of it. So for example, the school or the workplace. So you don't um, necessarily go to school and take all your classes um, because you have such a, a deep interest in every single subject that you're studying but you go to school and try to do well in your classes because you are striving for that material, material reward in the end, that diploma, 
and then that job that the diploma um, kind of opens doors for. Now, what is a bureaucracy? So if we think back to chapter one and chapter four, where we talked about Max Weber, one of our founding fathers of sociology, remember he wrote a lot about legitimate authority and those different structures of legitimate authority um, with the charismatic and the bureaucratic being the modern forms of legitimate authority that we see today. Um, so we're not going to talk about the charismatic today, but we're going to focus a lot more on what is a bureaucracy. Um, so just to recap, um, remember Max Weber uh, also talked about kind of that disenchantment of the world, and he said that bureaucracies kind of brought that about. So we're going to kind of develop that thought of his today for the rest of this lecture. So let's just go over the basics, the characteristics of bureaucracies. So first, you have a hierarchy of authority. So a placement of one individual or impersonal office in charge of another. So there's kind of a line of hierarchy um, and everyone has very set responsibilities, which brings us to the second characteristic, the clear division of labor. So each individual performs a specialized task and um, this kind of specialization improves efficiency and speed because if, if each person is really great at doing one thing and everyone's doing their one thing at the same time, then that's going to speed up an entire process. Now the third characteristic we see in bureaucracies are explicit rules. So rules are outlined, written down, standardized. Um, you know, when you start a new job, they usually give you an employee handbook to read over and you need to sign to acknowledge that you've read them. Um, and they say, they, uh, they hand out the same handbook to all employees or maybe all employees with a specific role. So it is standardized. It's, it's not like they're writing a specific handbook just for each individual that's hired. And the fourth characteristic of bureaucracies is impersonality. So again, if you remember back to chapter four, where we talked a little bit about this and we talked about those impersonal offices of bureaucracy. Um, so this is hearkening back to that. So impersonality, taking personal feelings out of professional situations, um, and the same with like respecting the offices. If we think about politics, the impersonal offices of the mayor or the governor or the president, we respect the offices not because of the specific person necessarily who sits in that office, or who was elected to that office, but we respect the office itself because it um, is kind of one uh, feature of our democratic system. And the fifth characteristic of bureaucracy is meritocracy. And this means that um, hiring and promotions are based on merit. Merit being your proven and documented skills and achievements. So basically, hiring and promotions must be earned. You must demonstrate um, certain excellence in certain skills or responsibilities or tasks. And that's how you kind of gain recognition or get a raise or a promotion. And that's opposed to um, other kind of forms of, of hiring and promotion based on nepotism or random choice. Nepotism being, you know, giving a promotion to your, uh, your wife's second cousin or someone in your family. So these are our five main characteristics of bureaucracy. And in the next few slides, we're going to 
um, look at a specific critique of bureaucracies um, in modern society and kind of the bureaucratic structure of society today. So we are going to focus on a book by George Ritzer, another sociologist, and he wrote the first edition of this book in 1993, but he's uh, come out with updated versions since then. And um, let's just start with this quote in the bottom right, and then we'll work our way through Ritzer's book, The McDonaldization of Society, and what it is about in the next several slides. So that quote on the bottom right, Ritzer says, most specifically, irrationality means that rational systems are unreasonable systems. By that, I mean that they deny the basic humanity, human reason of the people who work within or are served by them. So over the next few slides, um, hopefully this quote will make a lot more sense to you. So what is the McDonaldization of society, as George Ritzer argues? It refers to the increasing presence of a bureaucratic fast food business model in common social institutions. That business model being efficiency, the division of labor, predictability, calculability, control and monitoring, and replacement of human by non-human technology. So Ritzer is very critical that this way of life can lead to kind of a very uniform, generic, and bland world. And Ritzer, um, as with most uh, modern day sociologists, usually they will kind of build their work upon one of our founding fathers. Um, so Ritzer is a Weberian. So he follows kind of Max Weber's um, theories of society. And so he's building upon Max Weber here. So when Max Weber said that kind of this bureaucratic um, model of society was um, very efficient and had a lot of benefits for society and its functioning, remember Max Weber also said um, on the other side of the coin, even though there are a lot of great things about bureaucracies, there's also kind of this dehumanizing aspect to it. Um, kind of makes everyone live in this, quote, disenchanted world. So if we think about McDonaldization, um, the important aspect here is that it's not just about McDonald's and it's not just about fast food. Ritzer just felt like McDonald's was a great kind of example of what he's trying to communicate. So McDonald's is just kind of this exemplar but he says that this McDonaldization, this process of kind of bureaucratizing the business model, um, it takes place all over society. So for instance, we look at a grocery store, for example. Um, cashiers check out the customers, the stalkers keep the shelves full and organize, deli workers slice meat and cheese, there's a manager, and so all these kind of divisions of labor um, makes the store more efficient. A lot of different things can be done at the same time, um, but at the same time, that means that um, only those individual people who are specialized in those tasks can accomplish them. So no one's doing everything, but all the employees kind of have their own specialized task in order to improve kind of the efficiency of the company. Um, let's see, number two, for the grocery store example, you look for and buy the same kinds of products, see similar store organization, and find the same brands for the same prices. So an example would be, let's see, a couple weeks ago, I went shopping with my um, sister and we went to a Walmart that we don't usually go to. And I remember when we went in, she was very frustrated because she couldn't find um, the aisle she was looking for. And she said, 
what's happening here? Why is this store layout different from the other two Walmarts that we go to? So kind of that store organization, that store layout, and kind of the general uh, store layout that we find across the country, really, um, it's very, it's kind of comforting. It also speeds up our shopping process. We know um, if you go into Walmart and you need beauty supplies, you turn uh, to the right. If you need dog food, you turn, you go a little further down. If you need um, electronics, you go to the far back of the store, etc. So you, um, you look for and buy the same kind of products and see that same store organization. And you see the same brands. So if you go into any um, Publix, you're probably going to find the same kind of brands. There might be a couple like local brands sold in the Publix, but by and large, if um, you can find Wheaties in one Publix, in aisle six, you'll probably find Wheaties in aisle six um, in every Publix across the country. So that um, is the aspect of predictability to McDonaldization. So we know what we are expecting when we get to a lot of these McDonaldized businesses. The third aspect is calculability. So goods are sold by a predetermined price or weight and employees are paid by units of time. So everything's very calculable. It's not like in the old days when you went to your neighborhood market and you could possibly barter or um, try to come up with some sort of bargain with the store owner. Things are sold at a predetermined price. You can't finagle your way out of the price of the products that we buy. So it's very calculable. And then at the same time, employees are paid by units of time. So rather than um, paid by the for how much they sell each day, they're paid by a predetermined wage, $8, $10, $12 an hour. Um, and they know that they can expect that and they can calculate how much they will have earned by the end of the day. And on the other hand, managers can calculate how much they will need to put toward wages at the end of the day. And the fourth aspect here is control and monitoring. So if we take the grocery store example, store employees wear a uniform and a name tag so they're easily identifiable. Security cameras monitor the store. Um, that's both to keep an eye on employees, but also shoppers and make sure no one is shoplifting. And then some parts of the store, like the break room or the stock room, are considered off limits to customers. So there's an aspect of control there. You can control um, what products you're bringing out and how many boxes of cereal are going to be on the shelf at any one time. So these are our four main aspects of McDonaldization. And over the next few slides, I have put some excerpts in from George Ritzer's McDonaldization of Society book. And we'll just read over these so you get a better example of those four aspects. And then we'll talk about kind of um, his fifth aspect of McDonaldization, which he calls the irrationality of rationality. But we'll get to that in a few slides. Now over the next few slides, I have some excerpts from Ritzer here in his um, book from 1993, The McDonaldization of Society. And you can find um, the full excerpt on Blackboard under the chapter six lesson link. And we'll also watch some videos after these excerpts and those excerpt and those videos, sorry, are also accessible on Blackboard under chapter six. So let's go through these um, next few slides and just read over kind of the key points that Ritzer is trying to make here. So here is his introduction. 
McDonald's is the basis of one of the most influential developments in contemporary society. Its reverberations extend far beyond its point of origin in the U.S. and in the fast food business. It has influenced a wide range of undertakings, indeed the way of life of a significant portion of the world. And that impact is likely to expand at an accelerating rate. However, this is not about McDonald's or even about the fast food business. Rather, McDonald's serves here as the major example, the paradigm of a wide ranging process I call McDonaldization. That is, the process by which the principles of the fast food restaurant are coming to dominate more and more sectors of American society, as well as the rest of the world. As you will see, McDonaldization affects not only the restaurant business, but also virtually every other aspect of society. McDonaldization has shown every sign of being an inexorable process, sweeping through seemingly impervious institutions and regions of the world. So again, here he's saying, even though it's called McDonaldization, it's kind of just a term, and yes, it's very easy to kind of draw out his argument by looking at McDonald's and fast food, but it's not, he's saying that this kind of process of essentially bureaucratization, um, it spreads out far beyond just fast food. It's, um, as we'll see in a few slides, he also talks about McDonaldization of the university, the McDonaldization of the church, of the police force, of the military, of hospitals. So he's arguing that this kind of bureaucratic process has spread into every aspect of our lives. But McDonald's is kind of the quintessential um, example for um, looking at this process. The dimensions of McDonaldization. So why has the McDonald's model proven so irresistible? Eating fast food at McDonald's has certainly become a, quote, sign that, among other things, one is in tune with the contemporary lifestyle. There's also a kind of magic or enchantment associated with such food and their settings. However, what we'll be focused on here are the four alluring dimensions that lie at the heart of the success of this model and more generally of McDonaldization. In short, McDonald's has succeeded because it offers consumers, workers, and managers, and here's those four aspects, efficiency, calculability, predictability, and control. So now we'll go through um, what Ritzer has to say about each of those um, four dimensions. First, efficiency. So one important element of McDonald's success is efficiency, or the optimum method for getting from one point to another. For consumers, McDonald's offers the best available way to get from being hungry to being full. In a society where both parents are likely to work or where a single parent is struggling to keep up, efficiently satisfying hunger is very attractive. In a society where people rush from one spot to another, usually by car, the efficiency of a fast food meal, perhaps even a drive through meal, often proves irresistible or impossible to resist. The fast food model offers, or at least appears to offer, an efficient method for satisfying many other needs as well. I'm going to skip that next sentence because it goes back to something I edited out. Um, <laughs> Then other institutions fashioned on the McDonald's model offer similar efficiency in losing weight, lubricating cars, getting new glasses or contacts, or completing in income tax forms. So he's pointing out there other kind of way um, arenas where we notice McDonaldization or this kind of bureaucratization of business. So think of um, like Jenny Craig and weight loss. Um, it's a national company. You'll have the same weight loss plan, um, lubricating cars, you know, these quick lube, get your cars done in 15 minutes. 
get in, get out, um, getting new glasses or contacts. You have um, like eyeglass world and all of these chains across the country that promise you um, can get your glasses within a certain amount of time much more quickly than, you know, maybe going to your old childhood optometrist or um, income tax forms, all these companies across the country that um, offer to do your taxes for you for a set price um, within a specific quick time frame. So he's kind of pointing out different arenas where McDonaldization goes beyond just fast food model. So we'll um, go back to this last paragraph here. Like their customers, workers in McDonaldized systems function efficiently following the steps in a pre-designed process. They are trained to work this way by managers who watch over them closely to make sure that they do. Organizational rules and regulations also help ensure highly efficient work. So first dimension, efficiency. Second dimension, calculability. So calculability is an emphasis on the quantitative aspects of products sold. So the numerical aspects like portion size, cost, and the services offered, or the time it takes to get the product. In McDonaldized systems, quantity has become equivalent to quality. A lot of something, or the quick delivery of it, means it must be good. As a culture, we tend to believe deeply that, in general, bigger is better. Thus, people order the quarter pounder, the Big Mac, the large fry. More recent lures are the double this. For instance, the Burger King double Whopper with cheese and the triple that. People can quantify these things and feel they are getting a lot of food for what appears to be a nominal sum of money. This calculation does not take into account an important point, however. The high profits of fast food chains indicate that the owners, not the consumers, get the best deal. And then the uh, next little excerpt on the right. People also tend to calculate how much time it will take to drive to McDonald's, be served the food, eat it, and return home. Then they compare that interval of to the time required to prepare a home cooked meal. They often conclude rightly or wrongly that a trip to the fast food restaurant will take less time than eating at home. This sort of calculation particularly supports home delivery franchises such as Domino's as well as other chains that emphasize time saving. A notable example of time saving in another sort of chain is Lens Crafters, which promises people Glasses fast, glasses in one hour. Some McDonaldized institutions combine the emphases on time and money. Domino's promises pizza delivery in half an hour, or the pizza is free. Again, he wrote this in, 19, in the early 1990s when that was still true. Um, pizza Hut will serve a personal pan pizza in five minutes, or it too will be free. Again, not true anymore. Um, workers in McDonaldized systems also tend to emphasize the quantitative rather than the qualitative aspects of their work. Since the quality of the work is allowed to vary little because, you know, they have to make everything according to this efficient plan, workers focus on things such as how quickly tasks can be accomplished. So it's more about the quantitative aspect of it. In a situation analogous to that of the customer, workers are expected to do a lot of work very quickly for low pay. Now, the third aspect of McDonaldization is predictability. So McDonald's also offers predictability, the assurance that products and services will be the same over time and in all locales. The Egg McMuffin in New York will be, for all intents and purposes, identical to those in Chicago and Los Angeles. Also, those eaten next week or next year will be identical to those eaten today. Customers take great comfort in knowing that McDonald's offers no surprises. People know that the next Egg McMuffin they eat will not be awful, although it will not be exceptionally delicious either. 
The success of the McDonald's model suggests that many people have come to prefer a world in which there are few surprises. This is strange, notes a British observer, considering McDonald's is the product of a culture which honors individualism above all. The workers in McDonaldized systems also behave in predictable ways. They follow corporate rules as well as the dictates of their managers. In many cases, what they do and even what they say is highly predictable. McDonaldized organizations often have scripts that employees are supposed to memorize and follow whenever the occasion arises. This scripted behavior helps create highly predictable interactions between workers and customers. And the fourth dimension of McDonaldization here is control through non-human technology. So that fourth element in McDonald's success, control, is exerted over the people who enter the world of McDonald's. Lines, limited menus, few options, and uncomfortable seats all lead diners to do what management wishes them to do, eat quickly and leave. Furthermore, the drive through and in some cases walk through window, leads diners to leave before they eat. In the Domino's model, customers never enter in the first place. The people who work in McDonaldized organizations are also controlled to a high degree, usually more blatantly and directly than customers. They are trained to do a limited number of things in precisely the way they are told them to do. The technologies used and the way the organization is set up reinforce this control. Managers and inspectors make sure that workers tow the line. McDonald's also controls employees by threatening to use and ultimately using technology to replace human workers. No matter how well they are programmed and controlled, workers can foul up the system's operation. A slow worker can make the preparation and delivery of a Big Mac inefficient. A worker who refuses to follow the rules might leave the pickles or special sauce off a hamburger, thereby making for unpredictability. And a distracted worker can put too few fries in the box, making an order of large fries seem skimpy. For these and other reasons, McDonald's and other fast food restaurants have felt compelled to steadily replace human beings with machines, such as the soft drink dispenser that shuts itself off when the glass is full, the French fry machine that rings and lifts the basket out of the oil when the fries are crisp, the pre-programmed cash register that eliminates the need for the cashier to calculate prices and amounts, and perhaps, at some future time, the robot capable of making hamburgers. Technology that increases control over workers helps McDonaldized systems assure customers that their products and service will be consistent. Now, Ritzer is fair in his book. He acknowledges that there are many advantages to kind of this McDonaldized um, model of business. So here are a few of the advantages that he lays out before going into his critique. So the advantages of McDonaldization. First, a wider range of goods and services is available to a much larger portion of the population than ever before. Second, availability of goods and services depends far less than before on time or geographic location. People can do things such as obtain money at the grocery store or a bank balance in the middle of the night that were impossible before. Third, people are able to get what they want or need almost instantaneously and get it far more conveniently. Fourth, goods and services are of a far more uniform quality. At least some people get better goods and services than before. Five, far more economical alternatives to high-priced, customized goods and services are widely available. Therefore, people can afford things they couldn't previously afford. Six, fast, efficient goods and services are available to a population that's working longer hours and has fewer hours to spare. 
seven in a rapidly changing, unfamiliar, and seemingly hostile world, the comparatively stable, familiar, and safe environment of a McDonaldized system offers comfort. Eight, because of quantification, consumers can more easily compare competing products. Next, certain products, for example, diet programs, are safer in a carefully regulated and controlled system. Um, people are more likely to be treated similarly, no matter their race, gender, or social class. Organizational and technological innovations are more quickly and easily diffused through networks of identical operators. And the most popular products of one culture are more easily diffused to others. So now we come to Ritzer's critique of McDonaldization, where he lays out um, the disadvantages he sees in this process. So again, um, he went over all the positive aspects, but he also says, along with all those positive aspects that bring a lot of convenience and predictability to our lives, um, there's also some disadvantages to this. And he calls this um, disadvantage the irrationality of rationality. And he also labels this as kind of this latent fifth dimension of McDonaldization. So here we'll read this little excerpt. Although McDonaldization offers powerful advantages, it has a downside. Efficiency, predictability, calculability, and control through non-human technology can be thought of as the basic components of a rational system. However, rational systems inevitably spawn irrationalities. The downside of McDonaldization will be dealt with most systematically under the heading of the irrationality of rationality. In fact, paradoxically, the irrationality of rationality can be thought of as the fifth dimension of McDonaldization. The basic idea here is that rational systems inevitably spawn irrational consequences. Another way of saying this is that rational systems serve to deny human reason. Rational systems are often unreasonable. For example, McDonaldization has produced a wide array of adverse effects on the environment. One is a side effect of the need to grow uniform potatoes from which to create predictable french fries. The huge farms of the Pacific Northwest that now produce such potatoes rely on the extensive use of chemicals. In addition, the need to produce a perfect fry means that much of the potato is wasted with the remnants either fed to cattle or used for fertilizer. The underground water supply in the area is now showing high levels of nitrates, which may be traceable to the fertilizer and animal wastes. Many other ecological problems are associated with the McDonaldization of the fast food industry. The forests fell to produce paper wrappings, the damage caused by polystyrene and other packaging materials, the enormous amount of food needed to produce feed cattle, and so on. Another unreasonable effect is that fast food restaurants are often dehumanizing settings in which to eat or work. Customers lining up for a burger or waiting in the drive through line and workers preparing the food often feel as though they are part of an assembly line. Hardly amenable to eating, assembly lines have been shown to be inhuman settings in which to work. It is more valid to critique McDonaldization from the perspective of the future. Unfettered by the constraints of McDonaldized systems, but using the technological advances made possible by them, people would have the potential to be far more thoughtful, skillful, creative, and well-rounded than they are now. In short, if the world were less McDonaldized, people would be better able to live up to their human potential. We must therefore look at McDonaldization as both enabling and constraining. McDonaldized systems enable us to do many things that we were not able to do in the past. 
However, these systems also keep us from doing things we otherwise would do. McDonaldization is a double-edged phenomenon. We must not lose fact, sight of that fact, even though this book will focus on the constraints associated with McDonaldization, its, quote, dark side. Furthermore, McDonaldization is not an all or nothing process. There are degrees of McDonaldization. Fast food restaurants, for example, have been heavily McDonaldized. Universities moderately McDonaldized, and mom and pop groceries only slightly McDonaldized. It is difficult to think of social phenomena that have yet escaped McDonaldization totally, but some local enterprise in Fiji may yet be untouched by this process. Now on this slide, there's a brief, I think six minute interview with George Ritzer, who's the author of The McDonaldization of Society. And he's being interviewed and he talks about kind of when he wrote the book, this is a more current interview. And remember the book was written in 1993. Um, so it's been quite a while since its first publication. So he talks about kind of where McDonaldization is now, kind of where the idea sprung from for him and um, kind of where he sees McDonaldization today. And in it, he talks about his inspiration from Max Weber and talks about Max Weber and the disenchantment of society um, and the irrationality of rationality. He talks about um, those different kind of destructive aspects of McDonaldization like um, destruction of the environment and kind of the effects on our uh, mental and physical health. And he also talks about kind of all these different examples of where we see McDonaldization, like in the university, the church, the police force, the military, the hospital, um, education system, the suburbs, dating websites. So we see McDonaldization and kind of this bureaucratic process. It spreads across our entire lives. Now on this slide and the last slide, the next slide of the PowerPoint, I have two clips from a film called The Founder that came out in 2016. And this movie tells the true story of a man named Ray Kroc, and he um, met Mac and Dick McDonald in the 1950s. So Ray Kroc was a businessman looking for opportunities to make money, and he came across kind of the first McDonald's ever and met the two brothers that started the business. And he was really impressed with um, their business model, which they called the speedy system. And the movie kind of, well, it tells the story of how Ray Kroc kind of took McDonald's away from the brothers and actually swindled them out of the business. But uh, especially the first half of the film focuses a lot on that speedy system um, and the way that McDonald's kind of bureaucratized their food prep um, preparation system by way of this very highly coordinated process, very um, strict division of labor, this emphasis on timeliness and getting the burgers out within 30 seconds, um, getting food to people as quickly as possible. So these um, videos on these slides are just clips from the movie. It is a great movie. If I think it's on Netflix if uh, you need something to watch this weekend. But otherwise, at least watch these two um, short clips here from it that will um, illustrate kind of what McDonaldization is all about. So in this first clip, it shows Ray Kroc eating his first meal at McDonald's. And then um, the brothers invite him inside to the kitchen to kind of see how they're prepping food, how the division of labor is working. And um, one of the quotes here 
that one of the brothers says is speed. It's the name of the game. And then he goes and shows Ray Kroc that the division of labor. So there's two people specifically flipping burgers. There's one person specifically um, at the fry station. There's two people that specifically just dress the burgers, put ketchup and mustard. Um, and furthermore, the ketchup and mustard is uh, measured out in specific quantities each time. So every burger that you get from McDonald's always will have the same kind of quantity of uh, mustard or ketchup on it and two pickles. And then there's a worker or two who are strictly devoted to the quote finishing station where the finished product gets wrapped up into a little wrapper and delivered to the customer. Um, and then we'll talk about the clip on the next slide here. So after Ray Kroc meets the two brothers, the McDonald's brothers, he takes them out to dinner because he wants to find a little bit more about um, their system and how they came up with it. And so they go to dinner and um, the brothers tell this story of how they came up with uh, the process of the speedy system. And so this clip um, takes place on a tennis court and shows how the brothers went out to a tennis court with all their employees and some chalk and they kind of mapped out the kitchen and the way the kitchen would work, um, the way that uh, would best work to get food to customers in the quickest amount of time and kind of shows them troubleshooting uh, the map of the restaurant out in order to great, get the greatest amount of efficiency. Um, so they brought the staff in to practice their workflow and make sure everything was, um, quote, choreographed like some crazy burger ballet. And uh, one of the brothers at one point in the clip says that this was a, quote, symphony of efficiency. There was not a wasted motion. So these two clips here kind of illustrate McDonaldization at... Um, at its core with a uh, focus on predictability, efficiency, and um, all through that speedy system. And that brings us to the end of this lecture on chapter six, groups and organization. And I hope you all will go to Blackboard now, read through that excerpt from George Ritzer. I only put a few parts from it. And um, definitely watch the videos that are linked to under the Chapter 6 content link. They'll help kind of bring these ideas to life and kind of illustrate it um, for you. So it'll be a little, um, a little easier to understand and see kind of these ideas in action. And um, when we come to the unit two discussion, one of your um, prompt choices will be based on kind of this um, idea of McDonaldization that George Ritzer wrote about. So if you uh, kind of find this interesting, keep it in mind and you can come back and write your a unit two discussion submission on this topic. All right, I hope you all have a great week and I will talk to you soon.